Ladies and gentlemen, given our need to get back in the uh, room sharply at two and uh, given the importance uh, of having uh, ample time for our speaker today, we're going to start just a couple of minutes uh, earlier while things are still being uh, served. A graduate of Smith College and Yale Law School, a judge of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit since 1979, and chief judge for seven years, and former chair of the Executive Committee of the Judicial Conference of the United States, Carolyn Deneen King honors us with her presence here today. The many highlights of her judicial career also include her receiving last year the Edward J. Devitt Distinguished Service to Justice Award. Two years earlier, the ABA honored her with the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award. Her notable accomplishments as chief judge included contingency plans for court operations well in advance of hurricanes Rita and Katrina, her creation of an emergency coordinator post, and her leadership in getting the courts back to their work after Katrina struck. When that happened, I remember looking at the Fifth Circuit's website and being impressed by the care the court was taking about such critical matters as calendar deadlines and extensions of time. Judge King is a native of Syracuse, New York, and in 2006, she received an honorary law degree from Syracuse University. At the earliest chance we had, after she finished her service as chief judge, we invited her to join the Institute's executive committee. She participates actively and devotedly as we knew she would, given her previous wise leadership as a chair of our committee on membership and as an advisor on products liability and transnational insolvency. She is an exemplar of the advice she gives to others. Whatever you do, do it with enthusiasm. Give it all your effort and do the very best job you are capable of. In her tribute, to Judge John Minor Wisdom, she referred to his zest for life, which she shares, and said that to bring these dispositions that are lovely in private life into the service of the law, this has been the special hallmark of his entire career. I'm happy to borrow her words in service of a like description of Carolyn. Judge King is married to Thomas M. Grieveley, an ALI member and senior Fifth Circuit judge. Her talk today will focus on the appointment process of federal judges with particular focus on the intermediate appellate courts. Please welcome our distinguished colleague, Judge Carolyn Deneen King. Mike said I could talk about anything, and I had a number of ideas, and then I heard what I, I think was the first call from one party to its base involving federal judicial appointments. We're in the middle of a political season, and I thought, that's what I want to talk about. That's timely. What I'd like to do this afternoon is to examine the challenges to judicial independence posed by the increasing politicization of the appointment process for federal judges that has characterized the last 30 years or so. I'd like to pay particular attention to the significant difference between how these challenges play out at the Supreme Court level and at the level of the intermediate federal appellate courts. My uh, remarks today are an abbreviated uh, reprise of a lecture that I gave last year at Marquette uh, law School that was reprinted in the Marquette Law Review, and I refer you to that be for the many sources from what I'm, for what I'm about to say. First, you know, yesterday we heard about Madison, so no, 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 no lunch should begin without a reference to Madison. And I want to recall 
why our Constitution provides for an independent judiciary. What better source? Madison and Alexander Hamilton. They saw an independent judiciary as having an important role in addressing both legislative and executive abuses of power. In Federalist 78, for example, Hamilton stressed, and I think these words are just critically important, though individual oppression may now and then proceed from the courts of justice, the general liberty of the people can have nothing to fear from the judiciary alone, but would have everything to fear from its union with either of the other departments. Hamilton believed that complete independence is peculiarly essential in a limited constitution, where courts are the only mechanism by which the constitutional limitations placed on the legislature could be preserved. Beyond these institutional dangers, he wrote that judicial independence protects against the additional threats that surges of public opinion pose to the constitutional limitations and to individual rights. Madison and Hamilton emphasized that life tenure and fixed salaries were indispensable for the judicial branch to remain independent and to limit uh, what they called an arbitrary discretion in the courts themselves, uh, what, what Professor Rakoff calls judges making it up as they go along, it was necessary to bind the courts, in the words again of Hamilton, by strict rules and precedents. So, the goal of an independent judiciary separate from the elected branches was judges who would not be subject to domination or manipulation by the elected branches or by the shifting passions of the people at large. And the judges themselves were to be constrained by the very laws they were to enforce. In the words of a modern day justice, Stephen Breyer, judicial independence revolves around the theme of how to assure that judges decide according to the law rather than according to their own whims or to the will of the polit political branches of government. Professor Dennis Hutchison of the University of Chicago, friend of many in this room, I think, has identified the key premise of Breyer's succinct formula. Judicial independence is not an end in itself, but is an instrument in service to the rule of law. Judicial independence and the principal end that it serves, ensuring the rule of law, are undermined by the high degree of political partisanship an ideology that currently characterizes the process by which the president nominates and the Senate confirms judges. It, it should be said at the outset, at least to some extent, this is nothing new. At several points in our history, presidents have scrutinized the ideological leanings of prospective Supreme Court nominees with the goal of nominating justices with views compatible with the respective views or perceived needs of these presidents. Uh, President Roosevelt, for example, was particularly careful about the views of the nominees to the Supreme Court and to the intermediate appellate courts after the court's rulings in the early 30s in validating pieces of the New Deal legislation that the president thought was crucial to the recovery of the nation. The Senate has engaged in the same kind of scrutiny as a part of the confirmation process. And, and I do want to be clear, there's nothing inappropriate with political or partisan considerations factoring into the judicial appointment process. You need to realize that, I mean, remember that the, that the framers vested the nomination and the confirmation powers in the elected branches of government. And it's to be expected that the president and the senators would seek judges whose judicial philosophies seem consistent with their own. That said, the last 50 years or so, and the last 30 years in particular, have featured an ever-increasing and contentious focus in the nomination and confirmation process on whether candidates for the Supreme Court and the intermediate federal appellate courts are committed, either by reason of their background and experience or by reason of explicit or implicit commitments they have made as a part of that process to particular positions on several politically salient issues, including abortion, civil rights, and the rights of criminal defendants. The force of this change has been particularly felt by intermediate federal appellate courts, 
whose judges had been selected under what was really a more ideological, ideologically neutral system of patronage that generally guided appointments until the 1960s. The conventional explanation for the emerging focus on political ideology in the nomination and confirmation process uh, is the watershed decisions involving the constitutional rights of individuals that began with the Warren Court. You know what those decisions are. Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 and the subsequent decisions dismantling laws that discriminated against blacks in many aspects of their lives the cases that broaden the rights of criminal defendants over the, under the Fourth, Fifth, and Sixth Amendments, the decisions recognizing privacy rights, including Roe versus Wade. The beneficiaries of these dec decisions had been, in, at least in their view, largely unable to obtain the protection of these rights from the elected branches of government. With the advent of these decisions, the federal judiciary became the forum in which the disadvantaged, or those who, who perceive themselves to be disadvantaged, turn to vindicate their rights. The Supreme Court led the way, but the lower federal courts were entrusted with fashioning remedies to enforce these rights. So early successes in the federal courts attracted members for and energized interest groups that were advocates for the disadvantaged. The federal courts were seen by these groups as the place to achieve social change. Now, you know, one can, one can quarrel whether that should be the case, is the case, but that's what the perception was. By the mid-1970s, conservative interest groups, also energized, sold, stole a page from the book of the liberal interest groups and sought to enlist the aid of the federal courts to overturn or narrow the gains of the so-called liberal activists in the preceding 20 years. And then beginning in the, in the, in the 1960s, which is really when is took hold, these policy-oriented issue activists started to ally themselves with the two political parties, liberals, of course, with the Democrats, and, and conservatives with a national Democratic Party, uh, and that's an important distinction, and conservatives with the national Republican Party. With issue activists swelling the ranks of the two political parties, or at least providing votes for their candidates, and with the federal courts being seen by these groups as a vital battleground, uh, appointments to the Supreme Court and the intermediate federal appellate courts became a critical element of party policy. Uh, as Professor Stephen Burbank of the University of Pennsylvania Law School puts it, the courts came to be seen as fodder for electrical, electoral politics with the view that it is appropriate to pursue chosen ends through the selection of judges who are committed or will commit in advance to pursue those ends on the bench. And the impression sought to be created is that not only are courts part of the political system, they and the judges who make them up are part of ordinary politics. With this historical backdrop, a significant goal of the appointment process for the Supreme Court and for the intermediate federal appellate courts has been the appointment of judges who could be relied upon to fur further the activist policy agendas. The reason for this seems to be that the leading political and issue activists in or allied with each of these parties are the ones who, if they're satisfied with the party's or a candidate's position on critical issues, will mobilize the masses to turn out on election day. And if they're dissatisfied, they and their followers will either stay home or worse yet, actively campaign against the party or its candidate. Particularly after the reported disappointment of Republican administrations with Justice Souter's perceived infidelity to the ideology of those administrations, reliability has become very important. As Professor Burbank points out, the risk that a judge might be won over by the rule of law ideal, <laughs> isn't that a great, <laughs> or might experience a, po a post-appointment judicial preference change has caused some presidents to seek uh, protection by nominating individuals whose preferences seem to be hardwired. For candidates whose views are less certain, the candidate might be, in, in Professor Burbank's words, induced nonetheless to commit to a desired path of judicial decision in advance. Another factor at work in the appointment process is the trend towards selecting nominees 
for the Supreme Court from the intermediate federal appellate courts. All of us have seen that at work. Well, this has the advantage for the selection process of providing a nominee's track record and information about his temperament and the advantage for the nominee of providing useful experience. It has the disadvantage of creating an incentive for decisions made with an eye towards advancement. A judge with ambition constantly has his eye on what the present or some future administration or Senate Judiciary Committee would think about a decision under consideration and how the decision would affect his chances for advancement. Several books and countless articles, and let me tell you, they are countless, have been written on the political ideology that each of the presidents, from Nixon to George W. Bush, has looked for in his nominees to the Supreme Court and the intermediate federal appellate courts, and on the degree to which that political ideology served as a litmus test for nominations. And I don't, I don't have the time to go into that today in any detail. Uh, it has varied very much from one president to another, but it is something that both parties uh, bear responsibility for. Generally speaking, the Republican presidents were looking for conservative judges who would reverse or, some, or narrow the policy gains liberals were perceived to have made in federal court litigation in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, and including gains in the area of civil rights and the rights of criminal defendants and privacy rights. To achieve these ends, in the view of Professor Goldman, who has written a great deal on this subject, legislative patronage, political, and policy considerations were systematically scrutinized for each judicial nomination to an extent never before seen. With, with uh, Attorney General Meese's uh, arrival, the, the process began of these very lengthy probing interviews between the Justice Department and White House officials and prospective nominees with the goal of ascertaining in advance how the nominees would rule on political issues important to the administration. And those interviews con continued through the Clinton administration and they continue to this day. And these selection efforts have been aided by conservative interest groups such as the Federalist Society, which began to develop in the early 1980s. These, the groups have come to provide forums and opportunities for advancement for their members and valuable opportunities for Republican administrations to vet their judicial nominees. The two Democratic administrations in the last 30 years have differed somewhat from the Republican administrations in the way that they attempted to satisfy the party activists. President Carter attempted to satisfy his liberal party base by appointing black and female judges in large numbers, at least as compared with the numbers that had been appointed by prior presidents. I am an appointee of the Carter administration, um, a fourth generation Republican, I might add. And when I told President Carter that, he said, I don't care about your political views, which I have to say was certainly a st stunning, but he didn't, as it turned out. Like Carter, but, but he, he dealt in mass. He, pre he, present, he just appointed women and blacks, and that's how he dealt with his uh, activists. Like Carter, President Clinton also saw, sought to satisfy party activists primarily by diversifying the bench and he, but he also continued this interview process uh, for the intermediate appellate court judges that began under President Reagan. And I'm, I'm, I'm certain that it's, it's fair to say that both Presidents Carter and Clinton were careful not, not to appoint judges with political views, at least that they knew about, on key issues that would be objectionable to the Democratic Party's base. As political factors have come increasingly to bear on a president's judicial nominations, the trend has been mirrored in the Senate confirmation process, which has become uh, much more contentious and featured a, an effort to, under, un, to understand in advance exactly how a judge might rule on particular issues. I need, to, I need to end this part of this description of what has happened with this particular caveat. What may, whatever may have been the commitment of a president to his political base, with respect to the political ideology of his nominees. Not every judge appointed by that president has fit the description of what he was looking for. Indeed, happily for the republic, many have not. 
But it's been clear to me in the last 50 years we've come a long way from the goal of the, of the framers of a judiciary independent of the executive and legislative branches. In the words of Circuit Judge Jeremy O'Scanlan of the Ninth Circuit, he said, by demanding to know in advance how a particular nominee will rule in a given kind of case, the political branches are exerting precisely the sort of direct control over the judiciary that Hamilton and the other framers sought to avoid with the creation of a separate and distinct third branch. But even without uh, direct or indirect assurances as to how nominees would rule, a highly partisan or ideological judicial selection process conveys the notion to the electorate that judges are simply another breed of political agent and that judicial decisions should be in accord with political ideology, all of which tends to undermine public confidence in the legitimacy of the courts. The loss of public confidence in the legitimacy of the courts, confidence that courts will impartially, in accordance with the rule of law, decide their cases, could in turn undermine compliance by the public with unpopular decisions. Now, having, having described what I think are the causes of the politicization of the appointment process and how it came to function, I'd like to examine the structure of lower court decision making and how it combines with strong partisan or ideological views on the part of some, some of its judges to imperil the fidelity of those decisions to the rule of law. And I'm going to do that by contrasting the way in which the Supreme Court functions with the way in which a large, a large intermediate fell at federal appellate court functions. The current Supreme Court has, takes about 80 fully brief cases a year. All nine justices hear and decide each case. Virtually all cases receive oral argument at which questions can be explored and alternative outcomes and rationales pursued by the justices themselves. Each case receives a full opinion and obviously there's concurring opinions and dissents. They're circulated in draft form with the justices examining each critically and asking questions and making suggestions. Now constitutional scholars and, and even newspapers and people on the street will tell us that there are somewhat consistent voting patterns by some justices in some types of cases coming before the Supreme Court. But there's clearly no such thing on the Supreme Court as click voting. Uh, every vote is carefully considered. A justice concurring in today's opinion may be dissenting in tomorrow's even on a very similar issue. The result is that the record in the case, the relevant law, and the resulting opinions are thoroughly vetted by nine of the country's toughest critics. First and foremost, and this I think is critical, the justices are accountable to each other for their work. Once the opinions are released, they are poured over by academics, journalists of every kind and stripe, lawyers and the public at large. They're held accountable for their work, indeed for their every word. As Chief Justice William Howard Taft remarked, nothing tends more to render judges careful in their decisions and anxiously solicitous to do exact justice than the consciousness that every act of theirs is to be subject to the intelligent scrutiny of their fellow men and to their candid criticism. It does concentrate the mind. Contrast this with the way in which the intermediate federal appellate courts work. First, the workload's different in quantity and quality. Um, using the most recent year for which statistics are available, 2005, an intermediate federal appellate judge on the average participated in the termination on the merits of 457 cases as compared to 80. Using another measure of workload, such a judge authored 154 opinions, and that meant he concurred in or dissented from 308 others for a total of 462 cases that bear his name. With the exception of a few cases that are heard by the full and bank court, we sit in panels of three judges. In my court, Fifth Circuit, only 20% of the fully brief cases uh, to give one example, are orally argued. As for differences in quality, most intermediate federal appellate court cases do not demand the kind of effort that most of the Supreme Court cases require, and most would have only one outcome, no matter who appointed uh, the panel members. 
but the sheer volume of cases means that not every case gets the full attention of all three judges, let alone the full in-bank court. Indeed, it would be an unusual case in which more than one judge on the panel reviewed the record, and not many cases benefit from an in-depth study of the applicable law by all three of the judges. This work pattern necessarily that the level of interaction between the judges hearing a case, among the judges hearing a case, is dramatically different than it is on the Supreme Court, and the level of functional accountability for his work of each judge to the other judges is correspondingly different. And as for external scrutiny, when our opinions are issued, most do not receive thoughtful review by anyone other than the parties. Some academics take an interest in some of our opinions, as do some journalists and bloggers. But on the whole, our work doesn't receive anything like the scrutiny that Supreme Court opinions receive. So what this means is that one or two of what Professor Burbank calls hardwired judges, whether liberal or conservative, and I can assure you they come in both stripes, on a panel can produce a result that is not true to the rule of law, either because it's not faithful to the record in the case or because it doesn't fairly apply the existing law, without that fact being apparent to anyone other than the litigants. In high volume courts, judges are often effectively forced to rely on what I call borrowed intelligence uh, to concur in opinions without a thorough grasp of the record or the governing law simply because there are not enough hours in the day to acquire a thorough grasp of the record and law in 450 cases a year. And it's not a big step from there to click voting. That is, to voting with or at the direction of other like-minded judges simply because they share common ideological objectives. Again, sometimes without a good grasp of the record or the governing law. After three decades of judicial appointments by presidents of both parties, based to some extent on partisan ideology, it should come as no surprise that click voting happens on occasion, fortunately not often, in more than one of our intermediate federal appellate courts. Madison, who warned about the pernicious effect of factions in Federalist 10, would be horrified to see them at work in some of our federal courts. What does this mean for the rule of law, for the principle considered so important to the framers that judges are to decide cases according to the law rather than according to their own views of what the law should be or to the will of the political branches or of the popular masses? The politicization of the appointment process, particularly for intermediate federal appellate judges, presents a grave danger to the rule of law. A judge who has been selected primarily for his perceived predisposition to decide cases in accordance with a particular political ideology may be consciously or subconsciously influenced to decide cases in accordance with that ideology rather than in accordance with an impartial and open-minded assessment of what the law actually is. Such a judge viewing a case through the prism of his ideology may misread or gloss over Supreme Court cases with holdings contrary to or unhelpful to his position. You know, it bears remembering that it's the Supreme Court cases that are viewed as the problem by many political uh, and interest groups. Or, the judge may misread the record in such a way as to distort the question presented or to facilitate a preferred outcome. The result in an individual case may be a decision that is not faithful to the rule of law. The overall result is some courts, and it's just some, that are fragmented into ideological groups having ceased to function as a court in many cases coming before them. And it's absolutely no answer to say that the Supreme Court is there as a constraining force to restore the rule of law to a case in which an appellate panel has not been faithful to the law. The judge bent on implementing his ideology knows that the appellate review of his decision is highly unlikely. As Justice Scalia confirmed in his dissent in Kyles v. Whitley, which is one of the rare modern day Supreme Court cases that solely involves the application of established law to the record, the Supreme Court is not a court of error. And the reality is, as he put it, the responsibility for factual accuracy in capital 
cases as in other cases rests elsewhere with trial judges and juries, state appellate courts, and the lower federal courts. Instead, they take cases where the law is unclear and need of further development or where the circuits are in conflict. And what that means is that the intermediate federal appellate courts are the courts of the last resort for all but a handful of cases that the Supreme Court will agree to hear. It's precisely that fact that's resulted in the politicization of the intermediate federal appellate appointment process. Political and issue activists understand only too well that ideologically committed judges on these benches can make an enormous difference in the outcome of hundreds of cases each year. And it would be a mistake to think that ideologically committed judges affect the outcomes only in cases that involve, you know, um, abortion, civil rights, or the rights of criminal defendants. My own observations suggest that these judges cast a much wider net. They have strong views, pro or con, on plaintiff's jury verdicts, especially but not only large ones, on class actions, on a wide range of federal statutes imposing burdens on corporate defendants, on the death penalty, on religion in the schools and in public places, on the proper balance between federal and state governments, and on and on. So, for this political season, if candidates for the presidency of both parties continue as they have now for decades to energize issue activists within or allied with their parties by promising the appointment of judges who will pursue the respective political and ideological agendas of those parties and their decisions, then judicial independence will continue to be severely threatened, and with it, the rule of law in the United States. There was a wonderful editorial in 2005 in the Washington Post that captured it, and I quote, the war over Justice O'Connor's successor is about money and fundraising as much as it is about jurisprudence and the judicial function. It elevates partisanship and political rhetoric over any serious discussion of law. In the long run, the war over the courts, which teaches both judges and the public at large to view courts simply as political institutions, threatens judicial independence and the integrity of American justice. That's the end of the quote. And I'll end with a hopeful note. I'm sure you'll be glad to hear that. Uh, Chief Justice John Roberts uh, sent what I thought was a powerful message not long after his appointment about the approach that judges should follow in today's highly politicized environment. In a 2007 interview with Professor Jeffrey Rosen of George Washington University Law School that appeared in The Atlantic, Chief Justice Roberts reminded us that Chief Justice John Marshall's continuous effort to unify his court to urge his court to speak with one voice was based on the recognition that a court so unified fosters public respect for the legitimacy of the court as an impartial institution that rises above ideology. Chief Justice Roberts also reported his firsthand observations of how the DC Circuit countered the politicization of that court's appointment process by working to achieve consensus by functioning as a court, as he put it. From these models, Chief Justice Roberts observed that a successful judicial temperament is marked by, and I quote, a willingness to step back from your own committed views of the correct jurisprudential approach and evaluate those views in terms of your role as a judge, close quote. By contrast, what he called the personalization of judicial politics in which judges pursue their ideological agendas at the expense of a unified court undermines the rule of law and may leave the public with the perception that judges are little more than agents of the political powers that put them into office. If Chief Justice Roberts continues to promote those views, and I would suggest to live by them himself, if in other words what he said was not just rhetoric, I am hopeful that judges will aim to follow Marshall's example. By refocusing on functioning as an institution, in the chief's words, courts can rebuild the institutional legitimacy that has been diminished 
by the politicization characterizing the judicial appointment process for the last 30 years. Thank you. Judge King, thank you for addressing a critically important and timely issue, uh, the nomination and appointment of federal judges, and what is reliable to a president or to a United States senator may be very different from what is reliable to the public or to the litigants before the court, and the enormous workload, the processes you've described, combined uh, sometimes with uh, unfortunate ambition are very, very serious problems, and we hope that we'll see uh, maybe the beginning of an end to that uh, polit politicization that you've described. Thank you so much for your remarks uh, and for your analysis. It's uh, so helpful on this timely issue. And with that, uh, I think we're ready to, uh, does anybody have the time right now? Is it, is it, is it we have a few minutes, I guess, so let's, we're gonna start at uh, two o'clock, as I understand it, uh, Lance, with the choice of law briefly uh, issue on a uniform commercial code, and then we'll return uh, to Doug Laycock's marvelous venture presiding uh, for his first time on employment law. Thank you all very much. <laughs>